Hey, what's up, Gam Fam, and welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, hit that subscribe button. Join the Gam Fam, it's lit over here. Today, I'll be reacting to Ren, and this is chapter two. Y'all, I don't think I'm like mentally prepared for this, like, or emotionally prepared for this. <laughs> like, I just feel like I have to get myself together to prepare myself for this. Like, I don't know what to expect, but I feel like it's gonna be heavy. Um, let's get right into this. Here we go. I'm nervous. A year of living in the nightmarish purgatory does strange things to your psyche. I was still trying to push through university but I found myself missing many lectures to stay in bed. I started noticing more unusual symptoms creeping in, a strange buzzing sensation in the soles of my feet. My vision started looking like fuzzy television static, something that I later learned was called visual snow, something with no known origin. My calf muscles started constantly twitching and spasming. At any moment, they wouldn't go longer than 20 seconds without twitching, and that could drive you a bit nuts. All these symptoms I still live with to this day. You just become very used to tolerating constant discomfort. It becomes kind of the norm. It kind of becomes like an annoying, unsettling radio static in the background of existence. I stopped taking my antidepressants after having cycled many... That's just really sad. You know, like, becoming immune to pain. Like, oh my gosh, I feel for him. I really do. Like, this just makes... That's why I said, like, I knew this was going to be emotional. This just makes me sad. Oh my gosh, okay. All these symptoms I still live with to this day. You just become very used to tolerating constant discomfort. It becomes kind of the norm. It kind of becomes like an annoying, unsettling radio static in the background of existence. I stopped taking my antidepressants after having cycled many different kinds. None of them helped. All of them gave me some new, some new kind of symptom or side effect, like insomnia, dry mouth, heart palpitations, wow. no libido, etc. I spent a lot of my time alone. But in the moments of respite, I'd hang out with friends. We filmed a band called Trick the Fox the year before I'd gotten sick. It was the one ray of sunshine I had at the time. I quickly became friends with a bass player called Charlie, and we developed some kind of musical telepathy where we both knew what the other was going to play before it even happened. It was the first musician I've ever felt this kind of chemistry with. I became a kind of third wheel in his Momoko's uh, relationship. With time, Momoko became like a sister to me. To this day, is one of my favourite people on this spinning rock. Mm. Performing with Trick the Fox was one of the rare times that I felt free. There was something about the duty of having to entertain others that let me escape the physical limitations of my own sick body, even if just for a moment. Mm -hmm. I usually pay for it the next day with what can only be described as an energy hangover where I'd be stuck in bed all day, but for me that was worth it. Those days I was still fairly functional. It was around this time I started losing faith in the, med in the medical industry. The more appointments I'd go to, adamant that something was wrong, the more of a hypochondriac they treat me as. Medical gaslighting is a real thing with chronic illness. Yeah. They chalk me down as someone who is always requesting blood tests, and my mental health diagnosis probably didn't help that. Strangely, they never tested me for any kind of pathogens. You know, you know, I'm sorry for pausing it, but you know what? People who have gone through something like this you know it's like they know more than the doctors it's like i feel like they do way more research and they come out knowing way more than what the doctors know and i'm like why is that you know like i appreciate doctors don't get me wrong like i am grateful for them but at the same time it's just like sometimes I'm like, do you guys like actually do your research? Do you remember what you learned in college? Do you remember what you, you know, learned during your uh, residency and stuff like that? Cause it's like, sometimes I feel like it, it went out the window, you know? Like, I feel like, they're just there to get the, get a check and that's not all doctors so let me put that out there right there um that's not all doctors but some doctors i'm just like i feel like they're just there to get a check and it's just like we need y'all 
you know like do you understand that y'all are so important <laughs> to the to humanity in in general like you're important and you got your degree in this and we're trusting you to help us and some of you aren't helping us and that's where it's just like oh that hit me hard that's where it's just like uh why 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 is it all about money all of a sudden why isn't it about the people like it should be about the people you know what i mean and no one should go through this no one should like i i i'm i'm just i feel very passionate about this and i'm just like if if doctors really cared for the people and this isn't all doctors but if certain doctors care for the people then this wouldn't happen but a lot of times it's all about money and money is evil man like whoo i'm sorry y'all like i just Okay. We're embark on a precarious journey into the Russian roulette chamber of Dr. Google. I would type in the most predominant symptom of the day and Dr. Google would tell me that I have a rare disease and I'm probably going to die. With time, I sharpened my search engine axe and refined what I was looking for. I dived headfirst into the abyss of online support groups, hoping to find solace or answers amongst fellow sufferers. We were like crabs in a barrel. Very rarely, someone would find their silver bullet and announce what it was that cured them. Hundreds of people would follow their protocol, some with mild success, success, but most of us would still remain trapped. I joined as many online support groups as I could. It was a bit like the beginning of Fight Club, except instead of faking conditions to feel accepted, I was desperately hoping I had those conditions so I could cure myself and get the fuck out. I convinced myself I had conditions like candida, magnesium deficiency, parasites, adrenal fatigue, heavy metal poisoning, etc. At the time, I felt like I was single-handedly keeping Jeff Bezos in business. While most students were spending their student loan on drinks, I'd spend mine on the supplement or protocol of the week. I'd follow whatever herbal or sup supplement protocol was suggested, sometimes noticing mild improvement and sometimes getting a lot worse, most of the time feeling nothing. A story would pop up on one of these groups like, after I did a 30-day parasite cleanse of wormwood, cloves and garlic, all my symptoms disappeared. I'd read a story like this, get full of hope, and put myself through a grueling 30 days, which was often result in a, result in a worsening of symptoms. My body f felt even sicker and weaker, but I'd stick it out because I was told that this was a good sign. The parasites are dying. I peered into the toilet bowl and valiantly waved goodbye as I flushed their imaginary corpses into a watery abyss. Mm -hmm. At the end of the 30 days, I'd left, be left with a lighter wallet and all my symptoms still remaining. And if that didn't work, I'd move on to what was next. Maybe have seasonal affective disorder. All right, so I'd get on the internet, order a light, stare at it for 10 minutes a day, and to my big fucking surprise, still have all my symptoms. The only thing that that light illuminated for me was that I was desperate enough to buy a glorified table lamp. Mm. I kid you not when I say that over the years, I probably have taken nearly every dietary health supplement known to man. One of the most grueling self-treatment courses came when I did a round-the-clock heavy metal collation. I would take a supplement called ALA and DMSA, which supposedly shuttled mercury molecules out of your body through a process called collation. I would have to take the pill once every three hours around the clock, which meant setting multiple alarm clocks to wake up and take them. The supplements came with their own side effects. I, I remember one time standing in a supermarket and feeling like the sounds and lights were so bright that I couldn't even be bear to be in there. I stuck with this protocol for a whole year with no luck. I'm sorry for pausing it, but I just feel like the thing about me is that I feel it's like when I hear stories and stuff that people tell, I can feel it. I think I guess I'm like an empath. I'm empath. What's it called? I'm sorry. An empath. Empath. Y'all know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> like I'm having trouble, but. 
it's like I can feel other people's pain and I'm just like thank goodness for chats and like people going through the same thing and and people actually trying other things to see what works for them and stuff like that because like it's like when you look when you google things and you see that others have gone through the same thing and they've come out of that based on what they've tried like naturally or just you know doing their research and stuff it's just like why why aren't doctors doing this for us it's like i don't under i really it's it's mind-boggling y'all it really is because i'm just like i feel like i'm for the people like people are very important and we're here for a reason and we need each other so why aren't people willing to help when it matters it just doesn't make sense and i just i get so emotional because like i just think about the world in general and i'm just like <sighs> like we're all living in the same world <laughs> i'm sorry i'm like getting emotional we're all living in the same world like why aren't we willing to help each other and I knew that this was going to be emotional. <sighs> like, I just feel like some people aren't in the right position because there are people who want to help people. And I feel like I'm one of those people. Like, I don't want to see people suffering and just... I just really wish that there were people in this world who were just empathetic and just cared about the people and not the money. Like, you cannot take that money when you die. You can't take it with you. So what is the importance of money? Like, I don't get it. I don't care about the money. I care about the people. We are human. And we go through things and it's just like, why aren't we more empathetic to each other? Why aren't we more just like caring about each other? Because we all go through, the, through pretty much the same thing. Maybe there are people who go through things that are harsher than what you go through, but it's like we have to work together and just help each other out. I'm sorry, y'all. Like, this just makes me so emotional because I'm just like, there's just no reason why this should happen. There's no reason why this should happen. Like, if people did their jobs, there's no reason that this should happen. And it just makes me feel for him. It makes me feel for him and everyone who has gone through something like this. I'm sorry. Okay, sorry. We're still coming to terms with the death of one of my best friends during this time too. I was too sick to hold oh. down any kind of stable job, so I was mostly living off my student loan. While students study in England also weirdly get given a small sum of money just for being Welsh, or almost like a we're really sorry that you're Welsh sort of condolence prize. I've always prided myself on my financial independence, so whenever I could, I'd get out on the streets of Bath and I'd busk. I remember the very first time I did, I had my guitar in hand, I perched myself on a bench, took a deep breath, and then bared my soul to the jury of the street. 
and it was exhilarating. People sometimes ask me what music means to me, and it means life. This was usually the one time I felt like I didn't want to die. This was the one time I could feel a resemblance of something that resembled spirit, that resembled my soul, that resembled me. I even found myself cracking jokes with onlookers, which for someone dripping with social anxiety at the time was huge for me. It was March, roughly three months after Joe had died, and I was sitting on a bench in Bath with my guitar singing into a busy street. And this is when I would meet the first angel of this story. I'd see two more angels years later, one in the guise of a homeless man, one a doctor cheating death in the Beverly Hills clinic, but that bit will come a little bit later. The angel was walking on the opposite side of the street with a mother. They both stopped to watch me for a moment. I saw her mum whisper something to her. The angel turned bright red and she giggled and they shyly approached. We got talking and the angel asked where I was from. I told her that I grew up in Wales in a small village that was once described in a local newspaper as being worse than a Iraqi war scene. I told them they would have never heard of it. They looked surprised and they said they had family there. I asked which part and it turned out to be the village that I grew up in. Since you could basically count the population of two intergenerationally bred mutated hands, I asked who they were, and it turned out that that angel happened to be Joe's cousin. This encounter was always a foundational moment of serendipity in my life. In the years that followed, I took serendipitous occasions to mean I was in line with my purpose. Sometimes I felt like I'm following a script. It's just that I don't know the words or actions until they actually happen. But in moments of serendipity, I feel, in, I feel like they are playing out exactly as they were meant to. It was quite a bizarre moment for me that hundreds of miles away by chance this angel would be related to my lost friend. Upon learning who I was, they invited me back to theirs for a cup of tea and I accepted and I fell in love. It was really good tea. That week, the angel took me to her favourite botanical garden and she pointed out her favourite flower. So that night, true story, I dressed in black, broke in by climbing over the fence, dug up the flower and presented it to her the next day. She called me insane, but it's safe to say that angel ended up being my first serious girlfriend. It was like, it was a weird kind of relationship. We both shared an unusual trauma for people who were so young, brought together by a tragedy. Even though sometimes I feel like she, she might have hate, hated me at the time, I was convinced like it was some sort of Shakespearean fate that had brought us together. A morbidity that birthed light, that it couldn't be anything else. It felt like divine intervention. And she was pretty troubled in her, her own way, and I was very troubled in mine. But in between the sludge of dealing with the constant symptoms, it was beautiful. That summer, her parents took us to Centre Parks, which is a posher version of Butlins, if you don't know, where they paid for all the activities and meals, and they let me do whatever I wanted. Coming from a poorer family, I wasn't really used to being spoiled like, to that degree, but I figured I'd just roll with it. One morning while I was there, I got a call from my friend Sega, and he sounded pretty mixed up, so I asked him what was wrong. He told me that there was no easy way to say it, but one of them... One of my other best friends, Callum, had died. He'd gone cliff jumping in the same cliffs we used to jump off as kids. The sea was particularly choppy that day, and he caught a cross current, and he started to drown. Another guy that he was with had jumped in and attempted to save him, and they both drowned. The first day I met Callum, I was 11. He, he was in the year above me in high school, and he used to walk around with these massive, baggy, bright orange jeans. He hung around with all the goth kids and I thought they looked super cool. So the next day I painted my nails black and fashioned a ne necklace out of a severed extension cable from an old VCR machine. I infiltrated the group and I gained their trust. Not long after, me and Callum were friends, wandering around beautiful Welsh countryside looking for the most scenic places to smoke weed. We stayed friends for our high school and I truly loved him. When Callum died, I couldn't properly grieve. I felt weirdly numb after losing Joe. I'd often feel guilty for my inability to cry at the time. A couple of years later, I'd learned another friend of mine that I used to play function gigs with had thrown himself off a cliff face in Dover. And again, I felt numb. I couldn't tell if this new acceptance of the, of the inevitability of death was a beautifully liberating thing, or if it was a sign that my humanity was slipping away. To this day, death has kind of remained a bit of a matter-of-fact part of my life. During my years of sickness, I had to crawl through a morbid longing to be killed by my illness to find a more peaceful acceptance that death is just an inevitable consequence of life and it doesn't spare anyone. That never left and I've never really been scared of dying since. Some days I've tempted it. What I'm more scared of is having to live my whole life as a sick person. In my relationship with death, the most healing moment occurred just two years ago. My grandmother, who I loved to pieces, was dying but I actually got a chance to say goodbye this time, to hold her hand, to thank her for being alive. I remember not long before she passed, she was lying in the hospital bed, and she was very weak and very pale, barely able to open her eyes. I asked how she was, 
and it seemed like a stupid question as soon as it left my mouth. She paused for a long moment and she turned her head to look at me and she opened her eyes and she smiled and she said she felt happy. And it was just one word, happy, which was simple and it was beautifully profound. And that was one time I'd gotten a chance to say goodbye. And it was the first time that I hoped that one day I would die happy. The following year, I would achieve something beyond my wildest dreams and then I would lose it almost as soon as it came. Stay tuned for that. I don't wanna hear no words today Because they pull me under In the castle of my room I'll hide away From the outside thunder Gonna lock my troubles outside of this door Cause today it's just me in these four walls I said I wanna run away and fly to another place Fly to another place Say oh Said I wanna run away, fly to another place, fly to another place. The night that I hold it turns to gray, and that makes me wonder that I always feel this way. So far under it, I put my soul on show for everyone to see. Cause even though it's bruised, I know we hold such beauty. And though I'll probably, oh my gosh, I can't even talk. I know I'll probably lose some followers, but that's okay. I just, I don't know if it, it's like, it just, it hits me hard. And I feel like, I don't know if this means anything to you guys, but I'm a cancer. And so I'm very emotional. I'm an emotional being. And that just like took a lot of out of me. And this is why I try to like 
do other songs in between these chapters because they're so emotional and they make me cry and just feel emotions that I didn't know I had. And I just, I don't know, I just wish that humanity was just better, you know? Like, I just wish that we were all loving and caring human beings. But I know that we need um, people who aren't loving and caring because that just like adds to a part of humanity, but I just wish that we were all one and that we just cared about each other and what each other were going through and because we are living on the same planet and we and a lot of a lot of us are going through the same thing but we're too blind to see that we're too blind to see that we're all going through the same thing and it's just it really I'm sorry it just really hurts me because I'm just like if we were all like empathetic and just all cared about each other, the world would just be a better place. I'm so sorry. That just made me so emotional. And I really don't know how I'm going to get through the other chapters. Because it's just... He just like... He speaks such facts. And it's just like... Or we actually listen to what he's saying. We'll all like understand life in general. And we just all will be, I don't want to say a happy family, but we would just be all empathetic to each other's problems and realize that we're all one. Like it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I don't know why I'm so emotional. <laughs> like, it, it really doesn't matter what race you are, where you are, where you're from. We're all human and we all experience the same thing. It's just like my prayer, my prayer for the world is that we all just like find peace. I didn't realize that this would cause so much emotion in me. I can't even speak right now. I didn't know that this would cause so much emotion in me. But I just don't understand why the world is the way it is. Because we all need each other. And it's just, it really gets to me sometimes. And I wish that like we, I could be there for him. And because it's just like, he's going through a lot during this time and it's like, I don't know. I feel like I'm 
I'm using you guys as a therapist and you guys aren't my therapist, so I'm sorry. But that's just really got me emotional. I'm so sorry for crying, but it's just, it's who I am. And I'm an, I'm an emotional being and I love everyone. And I just feel like we just should all love each other, but there, it just doesn't happen that way. And it makes me sad. It really makes me sad. We're all human. We're all human. Like, I'm sorry. That was my reaction to that. Like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video.